Welcome back, everyone. Uh, my pleasure to uh, to start the uh, the next uh, part of the day, uh, which is where we've asked uh, a few companies to give us kind of five to ten minute uh, presentations on, uh, on on who they are and uh, and what they're doing. So starting off, we have uh, Brian Courtney from Kanavi Medical and. Uh, either Ahmed or Leo, if you're able to focus on Brian. Yeah, if I can get screen sharing, I will be able to do that. Okay, Brian, you, uh, you have screen share. Okay, great. Thanks everyone. I'll give you a quick update on, um, on some imaging uh, research that we've been doing in my lab and through Canavi Medical. Um, as a disclosure, I am a founder of the company, I have employment and IP relationships and others. Um, Kanavi is all around building imaging devices uh, for the heart and, um, and other minimally invasive procedures, but primarily focused on the heart right now. Our first product is an intracardiac echo technology that uh, could go up from the leg up to the heart and see various structures, guide transeptal punctures, and um, other procedures uh, in areas like afib ablations, uh, structural heart interventions, et cetera. Um, provided some very interesting views. It had some uh, 3D imaging capabilities that were novel. Um, it's not currently commercially available. It's something that we're still making some further refinements to before reintroducing it to the market. Um, but certainly the whole area of EP structural heart uh, and endovascular procedures such as on the aorta and the large uh, veins of the body um, are areas of interest. And uh, there was a fair bit of functionality in this, but we're continuing to make some refinements to advance it further. The company is primarily focused and has about 99% of its commercial energy focused on the development of a coronary imaging product where we have a catheter that fits inside the body and is, helps to guide procedures like angioplasty and stenting. Angioplasty and stenting is primarily guided by x-rays, which are projectional in nature. They don't tell you a whole lot about the vessel wall. And recent clinical data has uh, come out saying if you use imaging catheters, you reduce bad events by 50%. Back in December of 2011, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association updated their recommendation saying that um, imaging catheters uh, should be used as a class 2A recommendation, which is a modestly strong recommendation to reduce ischemic events in angioplasty procedures. So that's huge because there are 4 million angioplasty procedures done every year. It's one of the most common procedures done in medicine. And this image guidance technology is really starting to become um, closer to standard of care in North America. It already is standard of care in Japan. And I've been traveling a lot to hospitals in Canada and the US lately. And um, a lot of people talking about increasing the utilization of either ultrasound or optical imaging. Canavi is unique in that it's made the world's first system that combines both ultrasound and OCT imaging. These are both cross-sectional formats. Ultrasound can see through blood. Optical imaging has higher resolution and a very different contrast mechanism than ultrasound imaging. Um, and it's been used in about uh, 250 patients so far worldwide. Uh, this is an example of what a stent looks like uh, with ultrasound. And over here, you can see with greater resolution, the stents on OCT. Remember, you can get these pictures in the presence of blood. You have to get rid of blood in order to get these pictures, which is sometimes difficult to do. And if you do it too frequently, is not good for the kidneys. Um, here's an example of a pullback through a fairly complicated uh, artery with some calcified stenosis and other lesions. And we can see that there's a small tear in the vessel after um, just distal to where the stent was placed. This will likely heal on medical management. Uh, we want to make sure with angioplasty that the stents are nicely opened up, which is indeed the case here, and that there's a nice area at the proximal vessel that we went to a healthy part of the vessel with the stent. So this is done during the procedure. This is image guidance therapy for image guided therapy, um, pretty much uh, meeting all the criteria of that uh, uh, of that uh, phrase or nomenclature. Um, and uh, the decisions are made on the cath lab table within a few seconds of taking the images. This is what calcium looks like. This is what fibrous tissue looks like on ultrasound and OCT. The, there's some early lipids seen on histology. The IVUS, you can't really see the lipids, but the optical images, there's some attenuation of the optical signal um, driven by necrotic debris and lipid rich debris. So OCT is able to see some things that you cannot see very well with ultrasound imaging. 
And um, here's an example of a thrombus and a calcified nodule. Over here, this is calcium in the artery. It's very hard to expand those areas with stents and balloons. This is thrombus. This is where you're not giving enough blood thinners to the patient. Thrombus um, has a very similar appearance on OCT to calcium, but ultrasound can see through thrombus. It cannot see through calcium. And making this distinction during a procedure can be very helpful in terms of decision-making. Here's another picture of a plaque that looks large by ultrasound. The plaque extends all the way from here to here on this side and from here to here on this side. The appearance on optical imaging is very different where the signal does not penetrate into lipids, but it does penetrate very well into fibrous tissue. So we're going to learn a lot about coronary pathology with this technology. But as I said, you know, this is image guidance during a procedure. You have, you know, a very limited amount of time to make the decisions. There's a lot of data coming in. And so one of the things that we're working on is improving the automated algorithms that measure the size of the vessel, both the lumen and the outer border, as well as characterize different plaque components, such as calcification and tissue by using machine learning techniques and then comparing, initially training them with histological validation and then subsequently um, validating them against that histology or against expert user interpretation. Another area that we're working on is to always advance image quality with ultrasound imaging. This can also be used for MRI. We came up with some algorithms that have now been uh, patented in the United States and elsewhere um, with very good coverage for claims on new ways to remove ultrasound or sorry, noise in ultrasound or MRI images using artificial intelligence algorithms um, that is very different from conventional filtering techniques. So uh, in, in short order, Canavi is around uh, image guidance for minimally invasive um, uh, procedures, primarily focused on cardiovascular. And we see a lot of potential for using artificial intelligence to increase the efficiency of workflows, um, reduce inter-physician um, uh, variations in interpretation, and collect more data on items such as outcomes as it relates to various pathologies seen uh, in coronary disease. So that's a summary of what Canavi and uh, my research lab at Centerbrook have been working on. Great, uh, thank you very much, Brian. <laughs> uh, if, uh, if anybody has any questions, please, uh, please raise a hand. We have uh, time for one question. Uh, otherwise, we can, uh, we can move on to the next presentation. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, greatly, uh, greatly appreciate you uh, giving us a, uh, a walkthrough of uh, Kanabi. So uh, next, uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce uh, Felix baldo Lenchen from Altus Labs. Thanks, Raphael. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right, hoping uh, everyone is able to see my screen. Great, I'll take that as a yes. Um, so thank you to Innovate for hosting this initiative. We're delighted to have a chance to present um, in this showcase. So my name is Felix Wallach-Lenschen. I'm the founder and CEO of Altus Labs. To start with some background on Altus, uh, we are a computational imaging company uh, advancing personalized medicine uh, based here in downtown. We're Toronto. seeing your notes, but not your slides. Okay, thanks for the heads up. Let me try that again. Now we see you looking very focused on your screen. Yeah. I, uh, that's really weird. Okay. Well, I guess I won't, uh, I won't, um, go full screen then I'll just have to do, uh, yeah, you'll see the slides on the side as well. Um, you're able to see this now. Mm, nearly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Great. Um, so yeah, um, in sum, uh, you know, we believe that medical imaging is the richest source of clinical insight that has yet to be fully tapped. And in partnership with academic uh, medical institutions and life science companies, 
we develop radiological imaging biomarkers uh, to, um, uh, to really help guide personalized treatment and accelerate clinical development of promising therapies. And so um, for you know, this project here, uh, as, as, um, uh, for which we received uh, support from Innovate, uh, we've been focusing on lung cancer, which is a major focus of ours given its outsized impact on patients and CT scans, which are extremely rich three-dimensional reconstructions of the human anatomy play a key role throughout the patient journey from um, you know, screening to diagnosis, staging, treatment decisions, response assessment, all the way through to monitoring for recurrence. Uh, our first goal uh, was to enhance prognostic accuracy, so predicting survival, which is what ultimately matters most to everyone. Um, and doing this beyond the traditional tumor presence and size classifications uh, that are used, uh, you know, derived from imaging to date to facilitate that more personalized, um, you know, treatment decision. And we know that traditional criteria like TNM staging or ASSIST 1.1 are inherently subjective and can lack association with outcomes. Uh, and so instead of automating these criteria, uh, we let a three-dimensional convolutional neural network do all the heavy lifting and learn from a database of over 12,000 non-small cell lung cancer patients what features within the image, within the entire thorax are associated with survival. And so we attempt to remove all the human subjectivity from human interpretation by not forcing a neural network to focus on, say, just the tumoral tissue. And um, some of these results we have published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Uh, last November, for example, here with some Kaplan-Meier curves, uh, illustrating our ability to, uh, to stratify patients between low risk uh, and high risk. Um, and one thing that is a big challenge here is explainability. So, how do we know what the model is focusing on when we give it the entire thorax to generate a prediction? And so we attempt to do that by looking at heat maps, uh, as you can see here, and correlating that with known presence of uh, and location of primary tumors, which are circled in white on the left-hand side. Uh, we also do that um, by looking at known prognostic factors like age, sex, uh, TNM stage, histology, and we see a very nice stratification here when we go from the predicted lowest risk patients to the predicted highest risk patients in seeing age increase, the distribution of uh, female and male change substantially, uh, having more later, larger tumors and later stage patients in the high risk categories, and also more squamous cell carcinoma in those high risk categories, as would be expected. But there's a lot more work to be done here uh, to understand how our models are generating these predictions. Uh, next, our focus has been uh, on pulmonary function tests or PFTs, and these are an important component of the diagnostic workup for localized lung cancer patients for whom a surgery could be uh, a treatment option. And the decision to proceed uh, with surgery uh, or radiotherapy is really based on the, the patient's pulmonary reserve and ability to tolerate an anatomic resection. And so, uh, unfortunately, PFTs can take you know, weeks to get scheduled, especially during the pandemic, uh, and this can cause significant delay uh, in treatment. And delay in treatment, especially for early stage patients, uh, is very detrimental to outcomes, as you can see in some of the published uh, work here. Um, and so the goal here is, uh, is really to expedite time to treatment and move you know, that time to treatment to much shorter from the time of diagnosis where uh, existing publications for cancer centers in Canada have a median time uh, to first treatment of uh, 27 days. So uh, a very long time, which can be very detrimental to outcomes. Um, and so using the same approach that we did in predicting survival, we predict pulmonary function um, to, to classify normal versus abnormal PFT uh, and sort of triage patients uh, to, to PFTs and potentially eliminate the need for PFTs in patients that are predicted to be normal. So this is ongoing work we're about to submit uh, for publication here and excited to share those results in the future, um, but also wanted to, uh, to acknowledge the team here uh, and our collaborators at uh, UHN, JDMI, who we've been working with, as well as the oncology department, uh, Srini, 
uh, who's in the radiation oncology department, Dr. Natasha Lale, Dr. Kazuhiro Yasufuku uh, in surgery, as well as our support from uh, Bayer Pharmaceuticals. Uh, so yeah, we're very excited to, um, to be conducting these, these studies, moving into prospective studies later this year, uh, and are ex excited to expand our projects, continue to publish the results, um, and expand it to other solid tumor types going forward. So thank you very much for inviting us to present here and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Felix. Uh, that was a perfect example of, uh, of the use of, uh, of, of data to, uh, and neural networks uh, looking at, at serious problems. Um, I'll also uh, ask if, if there are any questions, if you wanna raise your hand. Um, if not, I think you know one of the one of the I'd say main accomplishments that that, that you've achieved is uh, is actually getting access to large amounts of, of clinical data. So I'm wondering if maybe you can you can talk a little bit about um, what structure, what collaborations you built in order to uh, to achieve this. Um, that's a great question. So uh, I think. Uh, First of all, solving interesting problems, uh, which all of us here are, are doing, I think is the, the first important step to exciting interest uh, in, um, in conducting these collaborations. Um, the second is, I think, very much around privacy, which is important to us, where uh, the data that we use never actually leaves the, the premise of the institutions that we work with. Um, and before we receive access, uh, it is fully de-identified, um, you know, based on those institutions, um, de-identification guidelines. Um, so, yeah, I think those are the two uh, largest hurdles that we typically need to overcome. And then the real work starts in actually cleaning the data. So combining, um, you know, identifying patients that qualify, you know, in our case, non-small cell lung cancer patients, uh, collating their outcomes data, their treatment history, their you know, pulmonary function testing results, um, their demographic information and so forth, all with historical imaging data that they received um, and, uh, and thus structuring our, our ground truth and ability to stratify patients by different clinical applications. Usually labeling is a big, big part of this too. And, our approach uh, luckily does not require as much labeling because we're feeding the entire scan into the model and, and, and don't really need to sort of you know, detect lesions and thus require radiologists to, uh, to segment lesions, um, which is a very resource and time intensive and it really enforces uh, uh, you know, what the input to the model is. And given that there's uh, so many important and various aspects and um, in, in the human anatomy that might be important, we, we don't want to make that, um, uh, that decision and want to let a neural network uh, really decide what is, what is important. Wonderful. Well, uh, well, thank you very much, Felix. Uh, I, I appreciate it. Um, we'll now uh, move on to, uh, to the East Coast. Uh, so uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Jeff uh, Leadbetter from Daxonics. Uh, Jeff, uh, we'll, we'll get you spotlighted and then, uh, and then I'll turn it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be presenting today and have the opportunity to meet everyone. We don't get to interact as often as we'd like being, as Raphael said, over here on the East Coast. So... There we go. So I'm coming to you today from Daxonics Ultrasound. And the theme of this uh, five minute introduction is and just to make sure, is everyone seeing the, the presenter screen or the full screen? The presenter. The presenter screen, not the full screen. Classic. Thank you guys. On the slideshow, yeah, okay. Now we see the there we go. full screen. So my theme for the day is interventional ultrasound, and that's really been a focus of ours in the recent years. So as a brief introduction to our company, uh, we're founded in 2013, and we currently have 25 research and development staff. 
And we really focus on the development of novel and integrated ultrasound technologies. And so for us, this means imaging, uh, diagnostics, and interventional technologies. And a way we like to refer to ourselves is full stack ultrasound product development. So we do acoustical and mechanical work, uh, electrical systems and software. Uh, we have facilities for prototyping and manufacturing transfer. And we really like to help at all stages of product development. And in the past eight years, we've had the good fortune of working with many organizations across the country and across the world, uh, ranging from research groups to startups to some of the largest uh, med device manufacturers in the world. So we really have four areas of core technology that we like to help deploy into different applications. And these are high resolution intraoperative imaging, uh, adaptable 3D ultrasound, advanced blood flow detection, and precision microablation. And to give you an idea of our take on these things, um, so high resolution micro ultrasound, we have capabilities both in producing very high resolution images and also packaging the imaging devices into very small sizes. And on screen here, I just have a, an example showing what is often called high resolution from a conventional diagnostic scanner, say 10 megahertz, and then a look at what's possible with true high resolution ultrasound. And the way I like to think about this is comparing uh, a roadmap to landmines. One is useful to, to orient and to assess the position of things, and the other is truly enough information to help with interventional uh, purposes such as surgeries. We've been working on adaptable 3D ultrasound, and essentially what that means, we've made strides at really simplifying the technology. One of the fundamental challenges with 3D ultrasound is the development programs are lengthy and extremely expensive. And recently we've achieved a means to have comparable performance to conventional approaches with a fraction of the development time and device complexity. We've also been working on technologies for advanced blood flow detection, specifically in coordination with our high resolution imaging capabilities. And this is enabled from a systems engineering side where uh, the underlying ultrasound system needs to have capability for extremely high data capture rates, throughput rates, and processing. And we've accomplished this through an integrated platform that uh, seamlessly shares data between the hardware and embedded level, uh, the PC level and graphics processing units, and even interface to uh, offsite processing. So bringing these technologies together, um, we've had the good fortune of being part of the Innovate Network. And the project we're participating in uh, is in support of uh, lead party Dalhousie University, uh, who is also supported by uh, third party on the project Synaptive Medical. The project um, that has been under work for the last year is called Development of an Ultrafast Ultrasound Platform for endoscopic image-guided surgery. Uh, so that's a, a lot of terms, but I think they all roll together fairly well. The aims of this project have been uh, advancing the platform for ultra-fast imaging with a focus on enhanced blood flow imaging uh, to further development of a 3D endoscope compatible with that platform. And the third aim has been integration with a surgical navigation suite. And as of last month, we've largely met these aims. We have just a, a screen captured here um, from a demonstration we recently gave. What you can see in this image is uh, one of our lead systems engineers, Dr. Chris Sampson, uh, using the system. So he has in his hand our endoscopic instrument uh, on the bench top with uh, brain phantom, and of course, up on screen, we can see the navigation data combined with real-time ultrasound imaging. So thinking of the future and where we'd like to go next, 
as I said, interventional ultrasound is our, our core focus. And to us, that means surgical guidance, biopsy guidance, uh, multimodal diagnostics, uh, longer term, very interested in image guided ultrasonic therapy, and of course, robotic surgery and surgical automation. So essentially, our current progress and results in the program set the, the platform. And we're now at a point where we have the data available to begin applying uh, computer vision, machine learning, and neural networks to really uh, make the most impact with the data that's available from our high resolution imaging technologies. Thank you. I'll open the floor for questions. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, it's, 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 it's really nice to see a, a project involving two Canadian companies and, uh, and the Canadian academic institution. Uh, I know it doesn't always work that way. We don't always have uh, all the skills uh, nationally, but, but when it comes together, it's, uh, it's very nice to see. Um, are, there any, uh, are there any questions for, uh, for Jeff? Yeah, I might have one. Um, on the last picture there, there wasn't any eye camera that you're using for the stereo tracking? Yes, that's right. So I've mentioned the Innovate project, the lead party is Dalhousie University, and they're supported by uh, us at Daxonics, and they're also supported by Synaptive Medical. And so the tracking system um, is provided by Synaptive. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, good, thank you. Great, well, well thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Um, We'll now uh, kind of uh, virtually come back to uh, to Ontario with a, with a, a different uh, project and a, a different company. Uh, so it's a it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Cosm Care and uh, and turn the floor over to uh, to Derek Sham. Hi there! Great to present to the group. Uh, can you hear and see me? Yes, we can. loud and clear. Amazing. Uh, so re really great to be part of uh, the Integrate Network. Um, we are Cosm Medical, uh, here to personalize pelvic health. Uh, last month, we just secured a four mil US seed round. Uh, we are aiming for Health Canada approval for gynothotics, our major product um, that we just completed our first clinical study on, supported by the Innovate Network. Uh, a little bit of background, you might be wondering why I am a founder of a uh, women's public health startup. Uh, my background is I'm an engineer turned general manager of Labry Medical, a gold standard urological diagnostics company that sold for $640 million at the end of 2016. I watched my grandmother go through this, knew some of the best doctors in the world, and really couldn't get a, the care I thought she deserved. Urogynecology was actually only accredited by the American Medical Association in 2011, and is a vastly underserved women's health condition. It happens to half of all women by the time they reach 80, and about 20% of women in North America will get pelvic floor surgery in their lifetime. Now, the diseases that, that encompass pelvic floor disorders include pelvic organ prolapse, the gradual descent or herniation of pelvic organs through the vaginal canal, starts with pain and discomfort, ends with debilitating immobility if untreated, and is very similar to hernias in men. And urinary and fecal incontinence are so underserved that adult diapers last year surpassed baby diaper sales here in North America. Now, pessaries are actually a common but relatively unknown therapy. They're intravaginal support devices used uh, to alleviate symptoms of pelvic floor disorders, kind of like how a bra works used to support breasts. They come in over 100 different shapes and sizes, fit by trial and error, leading to about a third of women failing pessary fittings, half stop using them within a year or two, and over half developing complications with long-term use. Uh, both clinicians and patients have issues with the therapies. And you might be wondering why um, this has to do with anything with image guided therapy. Uh, and it really um, points to the primitive, I would say, assessment technology currently used in the field. There's really two technologies currently applied. Um, the standard of care right now is called a pop cue, which is essentially a set of finger measurements. Uh, in parallel, there is 3D transperineal ultrasound, 
uh, which is around a $1 billion market in the gynecology and urology market, but has less than 10% market adoption in urogynecology. The major reason being is that the pelvic floor is soft tissue. So without additional information, taking a picture or an ultrasound image doesn't really tell a doctor a fair amount. Now, diagnostics dwells within a billion dollar categories uh, in this field. Uh, physical therapy is about a $4 billion market, uh, has effectiveness compliance issues, and is not indicated for prolapse, only for incontinence. As I mentioned, uh, pessaries, even with all their issues, a third of women failing pessary fittings, uh, have stopped using them within a year or two. Over 10 million pessaries are sold globally per year. Now, surgery in this field is in the news. After 100,000 lawsuits in the U.S. alone, the FDA banned transvaginal mesh for prolapse repair in 2019. Ironically, transvaginal mesh for pelvic floor surgery is currently growing at a 15% CAGR because there's really no other options for women with uh, pelvic floor disorders, uh, specifically prolapse, besides surgery and pessaries. At COSM, we're developing Gynephotics, a image-guided therapy platform to personalize pessaries for unique bodies and needs. Our platform really has three major categories, proprietary diagnostics, AI-driven cloud software, and 3D printing. We've secured two US patents, one Canadian patent. Uh, we've completed FDA Health Canada pre-subs. We've completed one clinical study with two ongoing, all three studies partially funded by the Innovate Fund. Uh, we've won multiple pitch competitions and the total available market of this is similar to the market size of the currently mature custom orthotics, dental, and hearing markets because of how common this issue is and how underserved the disorder is. Part of our secret sauce is uh, what we're calling copodynamic imaging, a novel technique to mold and scan the female pelvic floor. Uh, we have multiple Innovate, innovate and uh, NGEN grants to help us uh, essentially build a di novel diagnostic technique that involves a medical consumable, a balloon and catheter to inflate inside of the vagina to support, uh, to mold the pelvic floor, and then a 3D ultrasound to scan the mold. We just completed our first clinical study on it, demonstrating reproducibility and how every woman's vaginal cavity is different. Uh, Goli, who's joining me on this call, is presenting this this Saturday at the Canadian Society of Pelvic Medicine. So this is very new science. Uh, our AI really replaces outdated trial and error by automatically analyzing images and then predicting gynephotics design, uh, which is actually three separate predictions, success type and the dimensions. As we scale forward, we're, we're working with great partners in cloud software alongside 3D printing. And our overall platform is, is intended to replace clinical art with a data feedback loop where we take measurements, predict designs, and track how women are doing afterwards. Um, Innovate uh, has helped us fund a project to combine our work with uh, Sinai and Western into three clinical studies, uh, some of which have already been presented and we're, uh, we're driving forward. As we build forward, looking at replacing trial and error, uh, our goal is to uh, focus first on stress urinary incontinence and prolapse with potential indications Additionally, for fecal incontinence, preventing preterm birth, sexual wellness, and potentially becoming a wearable and therapeutic for gynephotics. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of surgical uh, lawsuits going on right now in this field, and we believe our measurement system has the opportunity to, for both surgical planning and post-cancer care. Uh, we're working with uh, some great partners, uh, currently growing our network and uh, aiming to be a billion dollar product category, um, uh, driving the improvement of life for 1 million women by 2030. Thank you. Great, well, thank you so much, Derek. I, uh, I, I really appreciate the, the COSM story as uh, kind of expanding uh, how we historically think about image-guided therapy and, uh, and COSM really taking the tools of, of imaging and uh, and AI to, uh, to have very direct and, uh, and real benefit uh, for patients. Um, again, I'll, I'll, I'll ask if there are any questions uh, for Derek. Um, not, but, but Derek, maybe I'll ask just because you, you recently closed a, a round of financing and uh, maybe you can sort of give a, a little bit of a flavor on, on what the atmosphere is like for funding um, and you know kind of two minutes uh, you said you you went to the states to get financing 
uh, whether that was a, a first option or, uh, or or last option. I think uh, I think the states is a first option as a founder based upon valuation, uh, but it was really something we we knew we had to do if not now, at least for our A round as we go forward. Um, you know, I think our you know, lead investor, um, they came up to us, they're like, we like gynephotics, but what we really love is the fact that what you're really doing is capturing novel physiological biomarkers, combining that with patient reported outcomes and leveraging AI to personalize care. And we wholeheartedly believe in your long-term vision that not just uh, improving care for conservative therapy. You can augment surgery. We could look at prevention in a, you know, uh, in a prenatal fashion. There's a ton of applications as we start to, you know, apply novel technologies and AI to, uh, um, to, to drive prediction. Um, if anybody's interested in fundraising stories, happy to, you know, powwow about uh, some of it afterwards. Uh, we do partner with pelvic floor physical therapists. Thank you for the question. Uh, we have uh, two P PTs on our group um, and pelvic floor physios are, are an interesting piece for our application. Uh, in Canada, uh, they're fully allowed to fit pessaries and in the US, they just got permission to fit pessaries last month as part of their, uh, their care pathway. Uh, and we have a different measurement system uh, or you know, lower cost hand tool uh, specifically for physical therapists because we don't imagine them buying uh, our scanning technology as we go forward. Wonderful. Well, well thank you very much, Derek. Uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, very exciting uh, company. Uh, so now we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start moving uh, west and our uh, next uh, company that's going to tell us a little bit about themselves is uh, Cohesic. And I, I don't know, Jordan, you're gonna present? Perfect, so a uh, pleasure to, uh, to turn it over to Jordan Angers. Excellent, thank you very much, uh, Raphael. And thank you everyone uh, for giving me this opportunity to tell you about Cohesic. Uh, my name is Jordan Angers. I am the CEO and co-founder of Cohesic. And what I wanna do today is give you an overview of our company and also the Innovate project that we're doing. So at Cohesic, our goal is to enable doctors to predict adverse health outcomes for patients with chronic disease, particularly those with complex chronic disease, uh, in order to personalize care and ensure that they have the best life possible. So to accomplish this, we take a decision-first approach. We let the clinical decision-making process guide what data we collect and present to our users in a novel information experience. And so our solutions are currently being used uh, in clinical settings, including advanced cardiovascular imaging services, uh, interventional cardiology labs, and outpatient clinics. And our customers are using our solutions to streamline their workflow, consolidate data, and accelerate quality initiatives. So our clinical solutions are built on Cohesic DI, which is our clinical decision intelligence platform for streamlining clinical workflow generating real world data from every single clinical case being performed um, and delivering patient level population scale risk predictions to healthcare providers. To date, we have focused on predictions that uh, support cardiovascular care, uh, such as the risk of heart failure admission, the onset of atrial fibrillation and uh, the risk of sudden cardiac death. Uh, and these prediction models uh, we are currently bringing to market so these solutions that are built on top of Cohesive DI really allow us to capture multi-domain structured data throughout all points of the workflow, uh, including patient reported outcome measures um, and informed consent, EHR phenotypic data, and clinical diagnostic results. So Cohesive DI really allows you to collect research-grade data while delivering clinical care. Um, and currently we have two diagnostic imaging modules, Cardio DI MR and Cardio DI CT a coronary reporting module called CARAT, and Intake DI, which is a module for capturing patient data. So our Innovate project is entitled uh, Development of Accelerated Cardio Cardiac Magnetic Resonance Technology and Discovery of Novel Imaging Biomarkers to Improve Outcomes in Heart Failure. And this is a collaboration being led by Dr. Eden Reufman from the Sunnybrook Research Institute um, and in collaboration with William Overall from Heart Vista. 
So the goal of this project really is to establish the infrastructure to allow for the development of predictive models uh, in a later phase. Our first milestone will be to validate the measurements from HeartVista's real-time processing, and then integrate those, uh, integrate HeartVista into Cohesic DI, allowing data to automatically flow into our Cardio DI module. So this is really a way to streamline workflow and ensure efficient data collection. And then finally, we are supporting a, you know, we will develop a plan for accessing, accessing and linking to multiple data sources within the Sunnybrook Research Institute to support the development of risk prediction models, very similar to what we have done at other institutions, uh, such as the University of Calgary, uh, where they run a world-class cardiac imaging registry. So by the end of this project, then data from Heart Vista will be able to flow into Cardio DI. Uh, and we will have identified the requirements for linking institutional data sources at Sunnybrook Research Institute to facilitate consolidation of multi-domain data for the purposes of heart failure risk prediction modeling. So beyond this current project, we are also looking for collaborators or partnerships for the areas I have up on the screen here, um, including validating heart failure predictive models, uh, facilitating decision intelligence infrastructure implementation, and delivering personalized risk predictions uh, following diagnostic imaging exams. Uh, so if you are interested in learning more about these projects or about Cohesic, please feel free to contact either myself or uh, our Chief Operating Officer, Christine Lorenz, uh, who is also on the call today, um, using the contact information on the screen. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, int very interesting presentation. Uh, let's see if there are any questions. We can switch. I'm in Leo. We can switch the mode so we can see other people. So, <coughs> while, so I do see one ready. question that was sent to me uh, directly, which was from Drew Heinmiller. Any reason we're not using ultrasound data? Um, that is purely where we are currently in our go to market strategy and our roadmap. Ultrasound is certainly uh, being used by us uh, in our predictive model development, and we are releasing a module for uh, echocardiography in the, in, the, in the future. So Jordan, a question for you. Um, how are you engaging with uh, clinicians and, uh, and different groups to, uh, to build these collaborations uh, that allow you to, uh, to do what you do uh, with your algorithms and software? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, we really engage with our customers, actually. So the platform that we sell today, our commercial product, uh, is uh, being used to optimize clinical workflows, even, even beyond, you know, without the current predictive capacity. Um, it's being used today to improve workflows and capture that data. And so for institutions that are interested uh, in essentially accelerating development of predictive tools, we... Uh, develop separate engagements essentially with them to uh, enter into a data sharing agreement, uh, be able to link all of their sort work with them to link all of their sources together, and then basically create predictive models that are tuned to their population, allowing us to uh, address some of the generalizability issues that we see with uh, application of AI in clinical practice. Um, Christine, I don't know if you wanted to add any additional comments there. No, I, I think you covered it. Um, yeah, it's basically cu yeah, custom engagements uh, for the particular needs of the each institution. Right. Thanks, Christine. Right, and I guess building value at the outset through uh, through approving processes, and then that has that allowed you to then grow your collaborations. Exactly. Yeah, our customers, our, our users are getting value today. They have, you know, we make no claims to the data they are collecting unless it is in an agreement. So essentially, this is a, you know, a software solution that you can use to create your own registry, your own uh, high quality data set for your, your own purposes or collaborate with us to, uh, to accelerate that development. And then maybe I will add um, that the intake DI application is not cardiovascular specific. So we have a number of collaborations in all areas of medicine. Um, so it's a nice customizable tool for gathering patient reported outcomes and other data. Yeah. 
and consent, which of course is key to all of us being able to use any of the data. Wonderful. Well, uh, Christina and Jordan, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, and now uh, for our, our last talk today, we will stay uh, virtually out to the West. And it, it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce Steve Reed from uh, Prisuna. Yeah, it's nice to meet everybody here. So um, let me know if you can't see this. I'm assuming you can all see it here. Um, so I'm the founder of Prisuna. And just a quick backstory about why I founded this company. Um, I've been uh, an engineer my whole life, been the CTO of two technology startups, and halfway through my last startup, I ended up contracting a pretty bad viral disease called viral meningitis, and um, that led to about a, a two-year recovery back to a normal life because it turned into a, a pretty bad chronic disease, and um, going through that, I just gained a lot of empathy towards other people with chronic diseases and just really wanted to find a way to, to help them, and uh, I just realized through that process that uh, serial ultrasound and medical imaging isn't really accessible to people outside the hospital to guide therapy for chronic diseases. So um, what I've been developing with, uh, with myself and a growing number of people is a way to make that more accessible for people with chronic diseases. And um, really that's the problem we're trying to solve is that chronic diseases are massive and they're getting worse. Um, in 2016, there's 1.45 billion uh, years of, of healthy life lost, which is the DALI metric here, wow, which is a pretty staggering amount. And that number is exponentially increasing every year, uh, which leads to so much human suffering. It's not just the people with the diseases, it's the people that are close to them. Um, the relationships just aren't the same anymore. And that kind of radiates throughout the whole kind of personal network a person's developed through their life. And uh, it's really a compounding problem that uh, seems to be getting worse because the sick keep getting sicker and there's not enough good solutions to help uh, trend this downwards over time. So what we're really working on is ultrasound guided therapies, a way to make that more accessible. And um, a lot of you are probably familiar with this in this group, but the idea is to take an ultrasound. Um, once you take an ultrasound of a certain area, you can start to quantify approximately how severe your condition is. So for example, heart failure, you take a bunch of ultrasounds over time. Um, if you take them of the lung, you can see basically how much uh, lung fluid there is based off of things called B-lines. And then with that, you can start to trend how severe a disease is and perform interventions earlier. So heart failure, if you apply diuretics early enough and precise enough, you can actually prevent a lot of hospital readmissions and improve patient quality of life. And um, you can also use this kind of data to, to validate the response of your treatments to see if they're actually working or not. And um, I think this is really a key kind of uh, concept for helping people with chronic diseases because it's not like they need immediate help uh, within the hours, but they need extended help over, over weeks or months to, to get back to a healthier state. Um, so really our mission is to accelerate equ equitable access to ultrasound guided therapies for as many chronic conditions as possible. Um, with the advent of ultrasound being portable and low cost now, it's cost about two grand uh, US dollars to get a, a butterfly device um, and it's portable, you can plug it into smartphones. Um, really, you can apply this everywhere. Um, and that's what's really opening up the possibility to actually apply this to chronic diseases outside of the hospital. Um, and uh, the number of diseases are kind of endless in my mind for chronic disease. So um, we're initially focused on congestive heart failure. And then from that, you can start to kind of do similar things with COVID and lung diseases. And um, yeah, the list just goes on and on. Um, we've recently been approached by some people that are interested in using our, our platform for space-based uh, ultrasound, which is probably going to be the imaging modality of choice in space missions as we start to explore more of our galaxy and go to places like Mars. So uh, really interested to see how we can kind of support those kind of use cases going forward. Um, so what we're building is a software platform, and at the core of it is uh, ultrasound quantification algorithms, which is basically what we're really focused on with the Innovate project here. And uh, around this, we're, we're developing and have developed uh, three applications. So uh, one we're calling the Competency Dojo, which uh, solves the major pain points in the market right now for ultrasound adoption, which is now that devices are so cheap, uh, the, the limiting factor for people adopting it is actually obtaining competency. So we've developed a way to actually obtain competency faster and more quantitatively. Um, number C or letter C is our, our kind of like core that we want to get to, which is the therapy guidance. Um, so we're, we're starting a, uh, we started a feasibility study here in Alberta where we're going to be um, teaming up with a health services uh, group here and uh, training their paramedics how to scan patients in their homes with congestive heart failure and using our platform to guide their th therapy. 
and D is the, the translational research because we want to basically develop a lot of different applications for different chronic diseases and different therapy guidance um, techniques. Uh, we want to develop a good kind of a translational piece between clinical and, and research. And um, that's really what the Innovate project is focused on with us is trying to build a, a good application around that to enable more therapy guidance applications over time. Um, and then around all this, we're, we're developing some privacy services. So um, we're starting to develop ways to automatically anonymize data to get it in and out of the platform easier, um, integrations into uh, third parties, and just general good security, but uh, ensuring that it can be shared in a very granular way, in a very secure way is important. Um, so the impact is, is pretty profound with this stuff. Um, it's, it's pretty new. There's been a few research studies that show uh, with lung ultrasound guided therapy, um, for heart failure, uh, you can actually reduce hospital readmissions about uh, 12%. And um, these are kind of the stats around uh, kind of how much heart failure exists um, for hospital admissions, what's the readmission rate, and what's the readmission cost. And the purpose of all this is just to show that there's so much money being spent on, on heart failure readmissions alone that um, if, you have, if you're actually able to reduce heart failure readmissions, there's plenty of money to go around for implementing solutions like this. So. For healthcare systems, they don't need to create new money. We just need to kind of gradually roll this out in the healthcare systems and transfer where the money's being spent to result in better patient outcomes. And really the, the ultimate goal, like I'm saying, is to reduce disability adjusted life years globally. So this is a, a chart of basically how the, the disability adjusted life years have been uh, impacted over the years through various different chronic diseases. And as you can see, it's, it's not slowing down. So um, we need more solutions out there, like our solution, we're hoping it can have a pretty big impact on this, but there's going to be a lot more solutions that are needed to solve this um, global problem here. And so really the, the main focus of our research in, in the Innovate project here is uh, longitude and the lung fluid volume approximation. And uh, this is a, a quick video of uh, some ultrasounds that have been labeled as part of this project by clinicians. And um, what we're doing is we're developing a way to make it really easy for clinicians to train AI models themselves without technical intervention. Um, so basically, they're able to kind of go in here and label video data sets um, without any intervention on my side. And then basically what we do is once they reach certain thresholds, we take their data set, train an AI model, see how well it performs. And then we can start integrating it into our, in our platform here in the coming months. And uh, the AI will start to produce a similar kind of output that you're seeing here. Um, and it's really a, a pretty big, profound um, uh, capability that we're developing here because um, we really want to open up the doors for clinicians to develop their own AI models without any kind of technical intervention. And um, we're also exploring things like uh, future profit sharing and revenue sharing that we can kind of uh, share with the clinicians who train these things because um, I just think there's so much potential for using ultrasound to guide therapy that there's a lot of AI models that need to be developed, lots of data that needs to be labeled. And I think that everybody should kind of uh, uh, reap the rewards of that kind of uh, effort together, not just the technology company itself that's uh, delivering the models. Um, and really, it's important to develop these AI models because um, there's with chronic diseases, you have to take uh, a lot of scans over time. And it's very cost prohibitive to actually get someone to interpret all these scans for each patient. Um, so you can do it at small scales without AI, but to really make an impact, you, you need AI to actually um, enable the therapy guidance at scale for patients. So that's why we're really excited to be part of the, the Innovate program here because it's really enabled us to accelerate this kind of development in our platform and, and bring this kind of uh, technology more, more, uh, more accessible to patients earlier, basically. So there's three areas of partnerships and collaboration we're looking at going forward. So number one, clinical services that service uh, uh, chronic disease patient populations, uh, primarily starting with congestive heart failure. Uh, number two, we're looking at partnerships with FOCUS experts, which um, FOCUS stands for point of care ultrasound. And uh, really, we're looking at kind of uh, involving experts in our platform to kind of um, do a lot of the interpretation and initially do QA, do training. And uh, we're looking at kind of using that as the, the precursor to enabling this at a higher level of scale while we ramp up our AI capabilities. And over time, there'll be kind of a more shared responsibility between the AI and the FOCUS experts in our platform here. And then thirdly, UGT research. So we're looking for uh, clinicians that are interested in developing these models with us and um, anyone else that has data they wanna, they wanna share and, and um, just people that wanna push this thing forward uh, at, a, at a higher rate than it currently is. So um, thanks for taking a listen to what we're up to and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, 
you know, hearing your, your presentation, the, uh, the term that comes to mind really is, is uh, uh, demo democratizing, uh, you know, both, both healthcare, where, you know, we're seeing a, a reduction, you know, in the case of ultrasound in, in the cost of equipment, uh, but then what are the steps needed to really have a benefit on, on healthcare and, uh, and, and reduce some of the, the burden on, uh, on the user? And then by the same token, uh, you know, your, your AI tools, which uh, then removes some of the burden of getting up to speed on, on the use of AI so that clinicians can play a more active role in, uh, in creating applications uh, that meet their needs. So, so thank you for that presentation. Um, let me put it out. Are, are there any questions, either uh, chat or raise a hand? No, well, Steve, let me uh, let me thank you again for uh, for coming on uh, and thank really all the presenters for showing uh, different work that's happening in Canada, uh, different ways that image guided therapy is being impacted and that AI and, and data is being applied to those projects. It's a, it's a very nice overview. Um, I'll now put us on break and I think we'll, we'll have a break until 2.30. Uh, when we should have a, uh, a really nice panel discussion start. Uh, it will be led by Anne Martel and will focus on how to engage uh, with AI and AI groups in Canada. So uh, stick with us and uh, take a break and we'll see you in, uh, in about 25 minutes.